overlap between um, mine and Kieran's, but as I say, as Tom was saying, um, I suppose what I'm going to I am going to talk about the community response to the drugs crisis, and I'm going to go back the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and now. But I'm going to go through them very quickly. Don't worry. Um, but I suppose the overall point that I'm going to be trying to make is that the response of communities to this crisis is very much, as Kieran has said, has always been about trying to deal with the the devastating, shocking situation they have on the ground in their own areas, affecting their own families. That, what, that's what the response of communities has always been about. Yeah. The response of the state has always been based on a different agenda. Sometimes we haven't seen that as clearly as we should have. The response of the state has always been based on a different agenda and different priorities, even at the times when it seemed to be kind of um, the same agenda as the communities. In fact, it never, never has been. And I think just going through the, the the kind of history of it um, serves to illustrate that. And I think the value of going back into history, it's like always about history. It's about learning, well, what does it tell us about where we are now and where do we go from here? Because I think that's always the most important thing, you know, where do we go from here? Um, so I'll start with the 1980s. I mean, obviously the 1970s, um, I mean, there were individual people using drugs in Ireland, but there weren't significant numbers and it wasn't a significant problem. But it was actually it was the end of the 1970s, the early 80s, that community leaders, as Kieran again has said, in the north inner city, south inner city, began warning um, that they were seeing heroin in their areas. And even those leaders themselves at the time, they were a little bit... Um, unsure about it because you know, heroin at the time was something that was unheard of in this country in Dublin um, it was something that was on you know, American cop shows and stuff it wasn't it, people found it hard to, to kind of understand um, that the drug had arrived but very very quickly and again um, you know, people who worked with young people could see this really clearly. Like, it was the usual thing that started when heroin was there first. It started with young people with this kind of, there was a bit of a buzz around it, you know, a bit of excitement. But really, really quickly, that changed into a situation where you could see the effects on the young people. You could see them getting sick. You could see people robbing from their own, which had never happened before. So very quickly, the community leaders were saying, this is serious. This is a serious heroin problem in this area. But these were voices from the north inner city, from the south inner city, voices that were not listened to. Um, nobody in the state was interested in listening to those voices. So as, as, as Kieran has said, I'm very um, eloquently described in the 80s the, the concerned parents against drugs responded um, and again as he said there's been all kinds of debate around that but at the time that was, it was the most sensible logical approach for people in those communities they were living with this problem that was escalating really really fast, it had come from nowhere um, and, and it had caught people by surprise, it was escalating really fast the drug was new, the drug was causing the problem so the people selling the drug were the problem, get rid of the drug and you get rid of the problem, that was a very sensible analysis that people have and um, so the concerned parents against drugs um, began that action which was about trying to get rid of the drug and uh, move on the people who were selling it. Um, Again, and Kieran has talked about this. The, you know, it's, it's always interesting to look at both the media and the politicians' response to the concerned parents. And again, Kieran, sorry, if you look even back in the 80s at the media coverage, the media coverage of this was not about the terrible heroin problem that's beginning to develop. It was about the activities of the concerned parents. And again, you know this with the media. The media feature most the things they like to give out about. So they were full of indignation about these activities, but gave them loads of coverage. Um, similarly with politicians, we had people like Barry Desmond, who was, he was Minister for the Health at the time, if I have it right, making all these sanctimonious speeches um, given out about, about local community activists and the disgraceful things they were involved in. So again, very much like here on saying, focus not on the issue, why are people doing this? The focus very much on what, what people were doing. Um, and that, 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 that's, you know, but, but I suppose the interesting thing about that was on the one hand it did, and because there was media coverage actually, because all this stuff was going on, and it's something the concerned parents succeeded in doing, they got attention to the issue. And there is a very clear message in that from the state. The state here doesn't respond to you unless you find a way of, of um, getting their attention. The concerned parents got the attention of the state, and it did mean that um, this unease developed um, a sense where we do need to, and, and, and the message I suppose from the state was, well, look, we've got to get rid of this bit of a nuisance, so what we're going to do is show that there really isn't a serious heroin problem, that they're exaggerating this. Um, and there was research commissioned, it was commissioned by the Department of Health, the same Barry Desmond in 1982, and basically what we're told at the time is his view, look, is this will shut these people up, you know, I'm sick of all this and I'm going to shut them up. The research was carried out by um, a man called Bradshaw, and it was carried out in the north inner city in 1982. And the, the results of that research showed um, that in the north inner city in 1982, 10% of the 15 to 24 year olds were using heroin. 10%, that was an absolutely shocking figure at the time because that was literally from nothing. 
from nowhere. Like a year or two before, there was no heroin in the area. And now when you think about 10% of your 15 to 24 year olds, that's a huge amount. When those figures came out, they were kind of shocking, you know? And um, people just didn't expect to see those kind of figures. They were shocked by it. So the, the, I suppose there was some pressure on the state, geez, you have to respond to this, you know? What they did was what they always do, they set up a task force, um, it's a very usual response. But the task, force report, well, the task force report was actually a very good report because it identified very clearly this problem, it's no coincidence this problem has happened in the poorest parts of the state. Um, and the, the, the way to deal with this uh, problem is to invest in those communities, invest in facilities for young people, invest in keeping young people in school. Very, very um, good uh, recommendations, very sensible. Um, but what happened at that, remember now, this is back in, in um, the report came out in 1983, this is back in 1983. So we had um, the, the information about what was going on, we had the information about what needed to be done about it, but we all know what happened. If you went looking for that report now, you won't find it because it was buried, it wasn't published, um, and absolutely nothing was done, nothing. Even though the information was there, the, the recommendations about what to do. And it's really, really important to say this because this goes right through the history of the drug. Sometimes people talk about the neglect of the state. It was not neglect, it was a deliberate, conscious decision to turn, the state decided we're turning our back. They knew, they had the information, they had the information, information about how bad things were, they had the information about what they needed to do, and they took a deliberate conscious decision that they were not going to do anything. And too, and again Kieran has referred to this, it was because the, the state's agenda at the time was completely different. They had two main things. First of all, at the time, sounds familiar, there was a recession. And as we know, a recession in this country is used as a pretext for cutting back on public services, having basically, they said, we can't afford it. All your youth clubs, youth services, education, can't afford any of that you, because we have a recession. Um, and then, as now, to some extent, they were allowed to use that line um, that, you know, they couldn't afford it. And the second thing, again, Kieran has talked about this, there was a really, really strong um, agenda, which was anti Sinn Féin, the IRA, and that took over completely. There was a paranoia in the government at the time um, about that. And, and again, as you say, more probably at that stage, more state resources went into... Um, smashing the concerned parents that went into dealing with the drugs problem. So that was the state's priorities um, at the time, and they were the ones they acted on, even though they didn't know about the drugs situation. Um, again, it's speculation. Um, we, I mean, we never know. But if, if some kind of action had been taken in 1983, again, I mean, we would have, you know, there's no point in saying we wouldn't have had a drug problem. I mean, there are drug problems, um, you know, in all major cities. But maybe, maybe it wouldn't have been as bad. Maybe it wouldn't have taken or maybe you wouldn't have but we don't know we don't know because the action wasn't taken but never let anyone say it was neglect it wasn't neglect it was deliberate decision not to do anything about it so i mean as and, and again i suppose it, the second half of the 80s going into the 90s um Again, it's what happens here in this country. If an issue is no longer in the media or on the political agenda, people have this idea, well, it's gone, and some people sometimes refer to the, the first wave of heroin and the second one. And in fact, there never was a first and a second because the first one never went away. There was an illusion to some extent that it went away because it went out of the media. Um, and a lot of the reason it was gone out of the media was, first of all, the concerned parents, I mean, had, had become less active because the, the, the amount of effort that was put into to smashing them and, and just the... Uh, the, the media, both the media and the politicians were no longer paying aid. It was on nobody's agenda, effectively. But as people know now, right through that time, um, the second half of the 80s, the early 90s, the heroin problem was spreading out, effectively. It spread out from the inner city into, obviously, into Ballyferm and Crumlin, the further, and then further suburbs, Ballymun um, was there early on. Yeah, and then out into Blanchestown and Clondalk and Talla, all those, those newer kind of um, suburbs. And I suppose by the mid mid nineties, uh, there was an estimate actually, I think of fourteen and a half thousand heroin users in Dublin um, by the mid nineties. And just the, 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 at different stages, people in local communities, um, they just did what they always do. I mean, I know people will know, say, in an area like Crumlin, um, a local woman just set up her own treatment service, found a doctor. At the time, you had to pay the doctors um, for the methadone. They just went out and found it. In desperation, sheer desperation, um, people went out locally in local communities to set up their own services. And Tala, I know one of the local groups went to the HSE, or the, they weren't, whatever they were called at the time, and said, you know, we have a huge number of young heroin users in our community, you need to help us. And they were told, come back to us when you have your statistics. 
And they said, what do you want us to do? Go to the doors of these young people and say, will you tick a box to say you are a heroin user? You know, I mean, that was the kind of response people were getting. So by the middle of the 90s, I mean, you had a situation across the, across communities, across the city, um, which was just becoming impossible. I mean, there was widespread dealing um, open. It was just before, I suppose, mobile phones became generally available, so it was still very open. Public spaces, in effect, had been, had been taken over um, as part of dealing. There were young people who were extremely sick um, and a lot of people dying. There were parents who, out of sheer desperation, were going out in the streets themselves. A lot of them trying to buy methadone on the streets. Um, and there were there were people, uh, addicts, who were desperate themselves, just desperate to try and, and get some help, but also desperate in in terms of trying to find money to uh, to, to feed their house. So we had, that was the, the the situation. And again, at that time, as Kieran has described, um, the the. the anti-drugs campaign re-emerged as coke had and again it was the same situation where the the problem at this stage was massive and um, but the state wasn't responding um, and coke had came came back on the streets and made it very visible again and um, i suppose the other other thing that happened at the time and i think and i think it's important because people put the you know and it's, it's interesting kieran is saying about the history but i think um with people see the the street campaign through COCAD, the anti-drugs campaign, and what happened with the setting up then of citywide drugs crisis campaign. People see them as if they were in opposition to each other. I think that's completely wrong. Um, I think there was the street campaign on the one hand, but I think there were also community leaders who've been involved back in the 80s, and they look back and they said, well, here we are 10 years later, <coughs> the same thing is happening all over again. And as Karen was saying, they realised we, it's not just about what we do locally. The, the government, the state, yeah. the, the state um, agencies have a responsibility to deliver the services. So we have to target them as well. We have to make them deliver. They're supposed to be delivering the treatment services. They're supposed to be doing the policing. Um, so the state had to be targeted. And that's, it, that's what City was very much about, was coming up with a with, uh, response across the, the um, treatment justice um, and education stuff to say to the state, you have to do what you know. You have to play a role. So in the mid 90s, you had, I suppose, all of that activity going on, um, and again, there was there was a lot of media coverage of, of the drugs issue at the time. But I suppose the one event that happened um, in in 1996, and people remember, was when when Veronica Gear in a shot. And again, this is significant, right? Because we don't again, we don't know if that hadn't happened, would there have been a state response? But what was very clear, while all of the activity was going on in local communities um, and trying to deal with the drugs problem and trying to make it an issue, what happened when Veronica Geerden was shot was that it moved the drugs issue from the local community's agenda onto the national. Because all of a sudden, the government went into a panic because the wider world out there, the more middle class communities got into a view. They were shocked at this. How can a journalist be killed? It suddenly became a threat to everybody. This was no longer about a threat to, to local um, communities. This became a threat. And so that made it go onto the government's agenda. And again, at the time, there might have been an illusion that you know it was a real attempt after that to deal with the drug crisis in local communities. It wasn't. It was it was the, a response by the government to what was seen by the broader community as a threat to the state, um, and that's what kind of that was the key thing. I think um, there was a huge contribution by the campaigns on the ground, but the state's reaction was very much based on on Veronica Gear and being shot, and the broader public outrage, very much fueled by by independent newspapers, who were very powerful. I mean, legitimately so. I'm not saying they weren't entitled to. to to highlight her killing but that that the key thing is that was the political priority it was not it still wasn't about really dealing with the drug problem in local communities but anyway briefly it did it did um it did mean in 1996 um that the rabbit report came out um, and that kind of, it, well, it did say very clearly that the heroin crisis was concentrated in the poorest areas. It did very clearly name them in Dublin. It did very clearly say that the, the um, response has to be targeted in those communities. And I gotta say, and Kieran was talking about the task force. I mean, I do think that for a short while there was some hope. Um, yeah, yeah. And a lot of the people, a lot of people remember me early meetings of the community reps from the task forces. There was hope because things moved quite quickly, like 1990 six the report came out, 97 the task forces were set up, a budget was put out um, for plans that were drawn up. Like in Irish terms that was very quick, that was a lot of stuff happening. And there was initially some kind of hope amongst people, well maybe, you know, maybe something genuine is happening here, maybe we're going to make progress. Um, but unfortunately again, the, the hope really didn't last very long. Um, and I suppose a, bit, a good example of that, I don't know if people remember this, this big announcement about the rapid campaign. Because again, at the time, like the government was saying, oh, we recognise that the, 
drugs crisis is linked to um, economic disadvantage. We realise we have to deal with that. We realise these communities need to be. They said all these things. So you'd say, oh, grand, yeah, they're on board. RAPID was announced just after the Drugs Task Force as this major investment program in local communities, and I was going to provide the facilities and improve it. And people would know what happened to that. RAPID turned into this little grant-making fund that would give you, you like, a few bob for your group. It very, very quickly became something completely different. And that's a perfect example of how, you know, the initial sort of uh, appearance of a commitment to deal with the issue just evaporated. And I think there's a real, real, um, I don't mean this to sound trivial because it's not meant to, there's an approach in this country which is very effectively used by the state and it's like your day in the sun is what I call it and it happens with the drugs issue and it happens to so many sort of um, really important issues. Because when, again, um, with, with Veronica Gearin being shot, that generated this huge kind of attention for the drugs issue, this huge kind of panic, and we need to do something. So the government responds to that, and they respond to it usually, they issue a report, and they set up structures. But the thing is that for the state setting up the structures is the end. That's it, we've done that. For, for people in communities, setting up the structures is only the beginning. They're no use in themselves. That's what you could do with them. It's the fact of community reps on them. Here I'm saying develop a real role for community reps on, the, on these structures. But for the state, the structures are, are not the beginning. They're, they're the end. And what happens very quickly with structures, and it happened with the task force, it's happened to every structure, partnership structure that's ever been set up in this state, um, as far as I know. And this, this may sound like a simple point, but what happens them is that they become bureaucratic. The, the greatest, probably the greatest weapon of this state is bureaucracy because it kills everything. It kills every, every response that you try and develop from the ground up becomes, it, it becomes impossible because bureaucracy, and that has happened to the task forces, um, they've been turned into administrators, they become administrators, they become bureaucratic instead of being able to do things. But it's a very effective, it sounds like, but it's a really, really effective way for the state to deal with them. With, um, you know, any kind of issue. And then it's more difficult to, to organise and have campaigns, because years back you could say there's nothing there, the state is doing nothing. And now they say, oh, yeah, we've got task forces. And it makes it more difficult. And local people are on task forces. They're on them less and less now, it has to be said. But it does mean that the state, you know, can stand back and say, oh, we've, we've got task forces, we are doing something. Um, and that's, that's, I mean, in effect, that uh, took a couple of years, I suppose, to happen. What that process happened, where those task forces, which did start off with great potential, became meaningless, and nowadays they're just a bureaucratic wing of government department, basically. Yeah. Um, again, I suppose very quickly too, the idea that in some way mistake, the state would learn. I wouldn't repeat mistakes. Very naive view. Um, in the 2002 general election it was very interesting. In 1997, drugs had been one of Fianna Fáil's um, top five issues in their manifesto, believe it or not. And by 2002 election, it wasn't there at all. It disappeared, and Bertie Ahern um, did an interview, I think it was on the Pat Kenny show, and he talked about how great it was there was no more drug dealing in his constituency. This was 2002 in the north inner city. Um, get down to the sign of travelling around in a state car all the time. This she an incredible ignorant statement. And again, we saw, and it was, it was a good illustration with the emergence of cocaine in local communities sort of around 2002. And again, this wasn't the cocaine used by, you know, um, recreational use by people who have money to spend blah blah at the weekends. This was the use of cocaine by people um, locally, people who would have been heroin users or young people who may not have used heroin but got involved. It was emerging very clearly as, a, as, a, as, a, um, as an issue about, there was a meeting where about people from about 40 different areas came together to say, geez we're seeing cocaine, this is really bad. So you think well we've gone through all this before now this time around you know people will listen to the voice of the community, they'll realise these people actually know what they're talking about, you know we've learned from the experience of heroin, not a bit of it, not a bit of it. You'll all remember our good friend Noel Ahern. Um, and then he stood up in the doll in 2003 and he said, No, okay, no, don't have to do anything about that. Why would we? He said, There's nobody showing up in the treatment figures. Yeah. There were no treatment services for cocaine, first of all, in fact, which escaped him, but also anyone who knows anything about the drug situation. And what we learned from the heroin crisis is that um, the treatment figures are always way behind what's actually happening on the ground. I mean, any, uh, people know that. But that was just a perfect example of having gone through all of, the, all of that stuff in the 80s. Nothing, nothing was, as far as the state was concerned, um, you know, there was no need for action. And again, the cocaine problem did develop um, in a huge way locally. Um, 
Yeah, and we saw we saw the, the, the all of the, the decision making around drugs just taken back in, re-centralised, I suppose. So again, with the task forces, the original idea was locally a plan would be drawn up. So you could have a different plan for Taladon to the north inner city to meet your local needs. Um, but that all went out the window and again started being driven from the centre. And I think there's another thing that's happening, and I think this is really crucial and really crucial for where we are now and where we go, is that in effect the drug problem has been privatised. I know everything else is being privatised, but the drug problem has been privatised. And this started with the last drug strategy because there are two... The, what we're talking about here is a community drug problem. And that happens when you've got an area where you have a really significant number of serious drug users, where that local area does not have the resources, where those individual people do not have the resources to respond, where the problem becomes very visible, where public areas in the community kind of get taken over by the problem, where people start to have a fear about what's going on and feel threatened in their own community. And where, I mean, to be honest about this, and Kieran's referred, a lot of the existing community networks break down because drugs yeah. does that to community because you have families, Tony, you have people, you know, yeah. blaming each other, seeing each other, your family, there's a dealer in your family, there's a drug addict in your family, we those drug addicts. Are, and it, we hear it all the time in the council, um, you know, antisocial behaviour, that great phrase, people are, and genuinely people, are hugely, hugely upset and frustrated about stuff going on. So it's, it's huge, it's broken a lot of the community networks that we always have. But the fundamental thing about that is it's, it's in a community drug problem, it is in poor communities because the resources aren't there. And that has always been the core of it, that it's a, it's a community problem and everyone in the community is affected. Um, but what we've got now is, is the privatisation, which means that is no longer recognised and drug use is now, it's an individual problem. You have individual drug users, and um, they should be treated, and that's it. That's the view that's now been put forward. And it started with this, with this, it started with the cocaine and the idea, well, and you'll hear this said, well, everyone uses drugs now. It's nothing to do with class anymore, it's nothing to do with poverty, everybody uses drugs. I, of course, loads of people use drugs, yeah, nobody's denying that. But it doesn't become the problem like it does in poor communities because individuals who use drugs often have the resources to buy the treatment, you know, to go to the places they need to go. I'm not undermining that it's a difficult situation for them, but it's a completely different problem. But the way it's, it's, it's the view now, like everything else has been privatised, is that the drugs problem has also been privatised. And there is no recognition anymore, none of the impact it has on communities. That has been wiped out. So in terms of where we're at now, I suppose, and, and I don't know where we go from here. Um, I mean, the drugs problem, the reality is it's, I have down here, low political priority. It's really no political priority, if the truth be told. Um, yeah, I mean, the, we're, we're back in recession, or whatever it is. It's even worse than a recession now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and again, we're being told just constantly, we have no money, we have no money, we have no money, we have no money, we have no money. Um, and, and you do see it, it's happening actually that, uh, you know, you hear all this sanctimonious rubbish about people come together in hard times and it makes them, it's, yeah. it actually what's happening is you can see that yeah. if there's a lot of people out there who say, why are we spending money on drug users? Yeah. It's all their own fault. I mean, that is a, quite a strong view out there, um, that it should, you know, we shouldn't be spending money on that. It's just if people have behaved themselves, then we wouldn't have a problem. Um, that view is strong out there. Again, as I say, the privatisation. So a complete um, refusal to accept that this is a community problem and that you need to support entire communities in dealing with it. That's no longer... Um, no longer. We've gone back to what, what happened in the 80s, which was the cause of all... Which is the cause of every problem in this country, to be honest, is that the decisions about the lives of people in poor communities are made by people who have no knowledge, no understanding, and basically no interest or concern in those people's lives. At the moment, we are of massive... Decisions being made about cutbacks and they're being made by people who are ignorant, uninformed and don't care about the impact they're having. We had a meeting the other night about community employment in the north inner city. Community employment supports practically every single essential so social yeah. service in the north inner city, from creches to childcare to after schools to adult education to meals and meals for elderly people. Everything is run by CE, everything. Um, and as you know, the, the, there's been massive, massive cuts in CE, up to around, averaging around about 50%, and a lot of the viability of those. Um, but the people making those decisions absolutely just have no interest. You talk to them and they say it's a labour market mechanism. End of conversation. That is some, that, that's that's the, the, the kind of um, 
And as I said, the Wheat Bureau, the, the, the task forces which had the potential to be really strong local structures have been turned into bureaucracy. And the, one of the worst things is the responsibility now for the local drug services, it's actually been thrown back onto the shoulder of communities, because I know people who are involved in task forces, and they're really caught, because half their instinct is to say, just let's say we're walking out, we're not having anything to do with it. But then there's a whole load of projects, um, which to some extent have developed a dependency on the task force, and I'm worried what will happen to the projects, the services, if you go. And that puts people in all kinds of binds, you know, about the responsibility. Just the, the, the drug problem now is, is, is in lots of areas, it's, it's endemic. This is the fourth decade of ago, 80s, 90s, 2000s. It's endemic in those communities. It affects every part of life. It's rooted, deeply rooted. It's intergenerational. We're looking at third generation. And again, the complexity of it, and this is why like, people always say, is it worse? Is that? In lots of ways, it is worse because it's more complex. Because it started off with heroin, and then people use cocaine on top of that. In some areas, they use crack cocaine. Then the psychoactive drugs, as they call them, came in. Now, even though the head shops have been banned, all those drugs are out there on the streets, available on the market, and people are using them. And a massive, massive use of legalised prescription drugs all over the place, yeah. um, north in our city particularly, you'll, you'll, you'll see. So the, it's, it's, it's become such a complicated problem too, um, that, that makes it more difficult to deal with. And you have children, and this I suppose is the most shocking thing, we have children born into drug use and living with it. Um, and the fact that as a state, you know, one of the wealthiest states in the world, that we allow that to happen and we have found it impossible to deal with that is absolutely, utterly shocking. And ministers getting up and talking about child protection and all this, I mean, it's, you know, it's sickening. So where to next? Um, after all that, <laughs> where to next? I mean, I think we do very clearly have to state that we need to go back to um, a targeted approach on the most disadvantaged communities. And um, there won't be any tolerance for that now because people don't want to hear that. And they think it means, well, you don't want to help, you know, drug use and other. It's not about not wanting to help anyone, but there is a particular drug problem in disadvantaged communities that I say is endemic and deep rooted. And we need huge, we need huge um, action to get rid of that. Um, but in the end of the day, it's part of a broader um, campaign around inequality and around poverty, um, and there is no other way. That's what experience showed us. We've gone through all these things. We've tried all these approaches, working with the state, and in the end of the day, because they had no interest in tackling, tackling the fundamental issues of poverty and inequality, that's why we haven't gotten anywhere on this. Um, so that broader kind of focus and campaign is, is, is where we have to continue um, if we are going to move forward. It's hard to be optimistic in the times we're in, but it's, it's, it's always back to you do something or you do nothing, you know, and yeah. whatever something we can do, let's do it. That's it. Very good.